It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the member for Mississauga Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, it's, it is the member from uh, Brampton Centre, but uh, always an honour to apologize. Brampton Centre. Brampton. Thank you, thank you, Speaker, and good morning. Uh, my first question is to the Premier. Speaker, getting support for mental health care has been out of reach for far too many people in our communities because mental health isn't covered by OHIP. Even though during the pandemic one in four Ontarians sought mental health or addiction support, not everyone was able to get that help. The Canadian Mental Health Association recently found that one in three Canadians who needed help couldn't actually afford to pay for it. Others went without care because their private insurance just didn't cover the treatments that they needed. It shouldn't be this way. Speaker, why are Ontarians stuck using their credit card instead of their OHIP card when it comes to accessing mental health services? In reply, the Associate Minister for Mental Health and Addiction. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you for that question. You know, Mr. Speaker, since day one, our government has said yes to finally building a connected and comprehensive mental health and addiction service system where services are easier to access, they are of high quality, and they're focused on better outcomes for Ontarians, including children, youth, and families. That's why our government launched the Roadmap to Wellness, our action plan that's backed by a $3.8 billion commitment over 10 years. The Roadmap to Wellness, Mr. Speaker, lays a foundation to build a system that will offer consistent, high-quality services to Ontarians when and where they need those supports. In addition to that, we've included the rollout of a signature program that's unique to the province of Ontario, known as the Ontario Structured Psychotherapy Program. The OSP program is the first of its kind in Canada, and it's funded Response. publicly for people over the age of 15 years. It's evidence-based cognitive behavioral therapy that helps manage depression, anxiety, and anxiety-related conditions. This, Mr. Speaker, is the commitment of our government to build that. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Speaker, universal public health care should include mental health. You're here. Experts have noted that the gaps in mental health care leave young people, particularly our children, on long wait lists for care. Children, Children's Mental Health Ontario estimated that the wait lists have grown to above 28,000 children even before the pandemic. Because of this government's inaction, students were kept out of classrooms longer than anywhere else in Canada, and we know that that took a toll on their mental health and well-being. In my community of Brampton, young people are waiting up to two years to access mental health services. That's why the Children's Health Coalition called for a Make the Kids Count action plan to address the backlog. Why won't this government implement this call to action by the Children's Health Coalition and increase support for children who need mental health supports? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Once again, listening to the NDP, I will take no lessons from you, nor will this government. The reality of the Order. situation is, when the opposition was in government, and perhaps they'd like to forget this fact, the government at the time, when they were in charge, voted no to more mental health beds. In fact, they closed 13 per cent of the mental health beds, and they closed 9,645 hospital beds in every corner of the province. In addition, they said no to more acute mental health care and cut $53 million from several Ontario psychiatric hospitals. In addition to that, they said no to $12 million to added new mental health beds in hospitals and to expand programs and support the mental health to support the mental health and well-being of seniors across the province in addition to that they repeatedly said no to more supportive housing and to the 47 million dollars for more supportive housing for individuals with severe mental health mr speaker we can't afford to go back to the politics of no our government is getting it done and saying yes to the investments that need to be made for mental health. the final supplementary well, Speaker, the, the Minister of uh, Mental Health and Addictions may not want to listen to the opposition and the concerns that they're raising, but they should listen to the Children's Health Coalition and the families and the children that are languishing on wait lists for supports. The supports that this government talks about will only work if people can afford to access them, Speaker. This is the underlying issue. There are just simply too many people in Ontario without the means to afford the mental health services that they require. But this government made it clear that they just don't get it. Experts, including the Ontario Health Coalition, 
Addictions and Mental Health Ontario and the Canadian Mental Health Association, as well as others, have all called on this government to reverse their cuts in mental health. The best way that they can do that is to invest in a publicly funded, universal mental health care system. Speaker. Why won't this government ensure that people across Ontario have universal access to mental health care supports? The Associate Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And once again, I do not understand where the NDP comes from when they say that investments are not being made. The roadmap to wellness was created on March 3, 2020. The government has invested in annualized funding, 173, 175, 176, and now is investing $525 million annually. You talk about the service providers and the stakeholders. We've invested in children and youth mental health by building the continuum of care. We've invested in education, an unprecedented amount, to ensure that the supports are there for the youth when they need them in the schools and connected to services outside. So I'm not sure where the facts that you're getting are coming from, but a continuum of care Order. has to be built over time. And we are building it, notwithstanding the fact that the previous government did nothing supported by your previous uh, supports. So we are continuing to do Response. what we believe to be the, the building of a continuum of care for the youth, the children, the adults, the seniors, through the roadmap to wellness. The next question is the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question once again is to the uh, Premier. Uh, today we are joined by cancer patients and their advocates who are looking for better cancer care here in Ontario. Take-home cancer care treatments are an expensive burden on patients and their families. Many Ontario families do not have coverage for all of the medications that may be needed. This means that patients are left with undue stress on top of their cancer diagnosis. Advocates with the Cancer and Tea Coalition say that even assistance programs like the Trillium Drug Plan do not cover all of the out-of-pocket expenses for these treatments. Speaker, why is the Premier allowing the gap to grow between those who can afford to take home cancer care treatments and those who cannot? The member for Eglinton Lawrence and Park Distance to reply. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I'd like to thank the member opposite for the question. The Ontario Public Drug Program provides access to drugs for eligible recipients. The Ministry of Health has established evidence-based approach to making decisions which considers the clinical effectiveness of a drug, safety, patient input, cost effectiveness, affordability, and effects on other health services. Take-home cancer drugs are funded through the Ontario Drug Benefit Program, and our government will continue to work to ensure Ontarians have access to the care that they need when and where they need it. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, we know that this government has politicized cancer treatment drugs in the past. For example, example sorry, uh, the member from Sault Ste. Marie compared these necessary life-saving cancer drugs to ice cream for his toddlers. Speaker, oh, shameful. Terrible. These kind of comparisons are wrong. The right thing to do, as recommended by Cancer Care Ontario, is to close the financial gap for cancer patients and make it more equitable. That would allow all Ontarians to have equal access to the most effective and approved treatments possible. Will the Premier listen to these cancer care patients and invest in the take-home medications that they need? Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite for this important question. Take-home cancer drugs are funded through the Ontario Drug Benefit Program, and as I said, eligible beneficiaries include seniors, individuals on social assistance, individuals residing in homes with, uh, for special care, community homes for opportunity, and long-term care homes, individuals receiving professional home and community care services, registrants in the Trillium Drug Program, and individuals 24 years of age and under who are not covered under a private plan. The Ontario Drug Benefit Program recipients pay the usual cost-sharing amount, as per any Ontario Drug Benefit Program, claims of up to $2 or $6.11 per eligible prescription and any deductible payment. 
Exhausting private insurance coverage first ensures that our resources can go further and provide better coverage for Ontarians. Recipients uh, 24 years of age and under with, uh, without private insurance, who have, they have no copay or deductible, and the Ontario Drug Benefit Program covers eligible prescriptions for non-low-income seniors uh, and other classes of recipients. Thank you very much. And the final supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, as the uh, advocates from Cancer Certainty Coalition have made it clear, there are many drugs that the uh, Trillium Drug Plan does not cover, and for the vast majority of Ontarians, private insurance is not an option. Other provinces have been able to make this change and ensure that their residents get take-home cancer care medications. There's no reason that Ontario should be lagging behind. Advocates here have a simple message for the Premier. They should not have to fight this hard to access life-saving treatments in Ontario. Cancer Care Ontario has made recommendations on streamlining these take-home drugs so that everyone, regardless of their income, can receive the best treatment possible. It shouldn't have to be this way in Ontario, where folks with cancer are fighting to access the life-saving medications they need to survive. Will the Premier listen to these advocates and fund take-home cancer care drugs once and for all? Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite for the question. As I indicated, the Ontario Drug, uh, Public Drug Program provides access to drugs for eligible recipients, um, and through this program, we are always, of course, looking at ways that we can improve access for people using uh, cancer drugs and even cancer drugs in their home, as I've said. So we have eligible beneficiaries. I went through a long list of those. Uh, it includes recipients uh, 24 years of age and under without private insurance. They have no copay or deductible. And we cover uh, prescriptions for non-low-income seniors. Um, other classes of recipients include have a $2 prescription co-payment, except for children and youth, other than those enrolled in the Trillium Drug Program who do, do have a copay and deductible, and of course our long-term care uh, home residents. Our government will continue to work with stakeholders and, uh, and advisors in this area to make sure that we have the drugs available for people when and where Response. they need them. The next question, the member for London Financial. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Last Friday, I joined London parent advocates Jessica Ashton and Scott Miller in their spinathon. They spun for a total of 13 hours or one second for each of the 50,000 kids that are on the Ontario Autism Program's wait list. As I sat on my bike, Speaker, I fully realized how tedious and frustrated and exhausted these families must be. It's been four years of waiting and broken promises, of vague answers and underspending by this government, and four years of increased debt and halted development for over 50,000 families who've been waiting without services. When this government decided to dismantle and destroy the Ontario Autism Program, did this government intend to shatter a generation with kids with autism? Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. Our government is implementing a needs-based autism program, and we will continue the important progress that we're making. We doubled the funding. We have five times as many children Order. in the program receiving support than under the previous government. There are 40,000 children receiving supports, most of whom would never have received support under the previous Liberal government's plan. We are dedicated and committed to making sure children with autism and their families receive the supports that they need. In fact, we have 32,000 payments that have gone out in the interim one-term funding. 3,365 uh, children are enrolled in behavioural plans. Almost 13,000 families are receiving foundational family services. Through the Caregiver Mediated Early Years Program, over 1,000 children are receiving Response. supports. The Entry to School Program, almost 1,000 children. We are making sure that children with autism receive the support they need, despite the lack of effort by the previous Liberal government. The supplementary question. Under six dollars then over six they receive five thousand up to seventeen that is not needs based the other issue is uh, the financial accountability office reported that this government underspent 343 million dollars on this autism program 
All that talk, Speaker, is not the reality of what this government has created, a 50, over 50,000 kids on the wait list. What these families need is a program that works. The Premier, I'm sure, is familiar with Stacey Kennedy. She spent a week camped out outside of the Premier's office advocating for more services for son Sam. Leah Kochmanerich's son was waiting, is waiting for over 1,300 days for aut autism Ontario Autism Program Services. Tony and his wife are here today on behalf of their nine-year-old twins, Rocco and Roman. Last year, they were at a point where they didn't know where to turn. They didn't know if one of their boys could actually remain living with them. Therapy changed that. Question. The necessary therapy and services are important. When will this government admit that it has failed to deliver truly needs-based program to the kids in this province with autism, and they deserve those services? Minister. Thank you, Speaker. The facts speak for themselves. Our government doubled the Ontario Autism Program budget to $600 million each, each year. Nearly five times as many children are receiving supports from the OAP today than under the previous Liberal government. We've increased support for our diagnostic hubs so that they can identify children earlier and connect them to new early intervention services that the previous government had no interest in funding. We've expanded the program so it covers more than one type of support. Member for Hamilton Besides Mountain, applied Pandora. behavioral analysis, families now have access to occupational therapy, speech language Member pathology, for Hamilton West and mental Pastor health Dundas supports through order. multiple streams that reflect the unique needs and experiences of children with autism. With with the help of the OAP panel and implementation Response. working group, we've developed a world-leading needs-based program, one that was developed by the autism community for the autism well, community. Well, the next question, the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Mr. Speaker, one in ten jobs in this province is connected to the agri-food system, and these aren't just jobs in rural Ontario. There are over 10,000 workers connected to the agriculture and food sector right here in the city of Ottawa. With over 1,200 agricultural operations in the city, many of which are in my great riding of Carleton, there is a growing demand for workers for these good jobs that lead to fulfilling and oftentimes lifelong careers. I was thrilled to hear that the minister recently announced support to help businesses experiencing challenges finding qualified employees. So through you, Mr. Speaker, can the minister please tell us how our government is working for workers in the agri-food sector and helping Ontario businesses grow and expand? The Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the member from Carleton for the question. You know, recently we we were joined by the member from Nepean and the, the member from SDNG for an amazing announcement. And it was clear farmers in Carleton really appreciate everything that our member does on their behalf. So good job and thank you for that. And it, it matters because she's absolutely right. Speaker, one in every 10 jobs in Ontario right now is connected to our agri-food sector. And I may be a little biased, but it is one of the best sectors to look for a job in. And in fact, actually, it's, it's a fact that for every graduate coming out of a program associated with agriculture and food production, there's three jobs waiting. And that's why it was so important to come forward just a few weeks ago with an important program called the Ontario Agri-Career Support Initiative, Response. a $4 million program that has been made possible through the Canadian Agricultural Partnership Program. And I'll share more details in a moment. The supplementary. Thank you uh, to the minister for that response. Uh, Mr. Speaker, without hardworking people in our agriculture and food sectors, we would not be able to, delo uh, to enjoy delicious, homegrown Ontario food that was made in Carleton and right across Ontario. Our government is so appreciative of those who wake up and go to work every day to keep our food supply chain moving. And part of this $4 million will be going to projects targeted to worker retainment and retaining to help more people advance their careers. Ontarians need a government committed to supporting creative and innovative employer-driven projects that are going to benefit the workers 
of this province. And I'd like to thank the minister for taking the time to come out to Carleton and meet with some of our farming families in Carleton for making and for making these exciting announcements there. And so through you, Mr. Minister, uh, minister Mr. Speaker, can the minister please share Question. more with the House about what types of projects this investment will support and how these projects will be used to develop long-term solutions for the agri-food sector? Minister of Agriculture. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And uh, it's important that everybody in the House today and, wa and those watching understand that the food and beverage manufacturing sector in Ontario is actually our largest manufacturing sector by employment. Wow. And there's exciting, leading edge, innovative careers waiting for people who choose to get involved in our industry. That said, we want to attract and retain more people. And that's why we made our announcement for the Ontario Agri Job Support program because we are going to work with employers and manufacturers to assist them with a cost share funding up to $80,000 and if businesses choose to collaborate as much as $200,000 to introduce English as a second language to enable child care on site to help people get to work Response. and also this pilot would enable employers to help address transit and transportation issues. We want people working in our agri-food industry, and we invite our employers to get involved in this program. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next question, the member for Beaches East York. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. We have been in a housing and homelessness crisis for the entirety of the past four years, and it has ballooned during the two years of the pandemic. Employed people are losing their homes. Working families can't afford to buy a home. Senior citizens are being renovated out of their homes, communities, and neighbourhoods and are unable to find other places to live. It is absolutely shameful that the Ford government has refused to act upon the recommendations of its own housing task force. Speaker, why hasn't the Premier acted to ensure that all Ontarians can afford a good place to live? Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Thanks, Speaker. Um, yet last week when we tabled more homes for everyone, we clearly articulated as a government that the Housing Affordability Task Force report is still our long-term roadmap to create the conditions uh, that I think we need to. But as well, municipalities were, were very unequivocal. They just weren't there yet. They felt that the Housing Affordability Task Force recommendations were too bold. So we're going to continue to work with our municipal partners. We're going to continue to uh, consult them and ensure that that Housing Affordability Task Force report is that long-term uh, opportunity for the government. But again, Speaker, you know, I, I think it's pretty rich for that member to sit there after all of the measures we put in place to increase housing supply. She votes against it every single yeah. solitary time. She should be ashamed for her constituents that she hasn't order. supported those measures. Side come to order. Supplementary question. Seriously, too bold? Government members really need to get out of their bubbles to actually speak to precariously housed and unhoused people before they decide what is bold and not bold. Red tape is not the reason that Ontarians are having trouble finding and keeping housing. Making life easier for developers is not going to solve the housing crisis. We desperately need more rent geared to income housing and stronger tenants' rights protections. We need serious measures to end the corporate financialization of housing. We need more missing middle housing like duplexes and townhomes. We desperately need to build tens of thousands of deeply affordable and supportive housing. We desperately need to ensure that everyone has livable incomes that ensure that they can stay housed, and absolutely none of this is in the government's plan. If the NDP had been government, the housing crisis would have been well on its way to being solved. When is Order. the Premier going to implement Order. measures that will actually solve the housing and homelessness crisis? Order. Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Well, Speaker, if Andrea Horvath and this member want to unequivocally say the uh, House that we have to refer to each other by our ministerial title, writing name, or other appropriate title. I will. You know, Speaker, if the NDP, as official opposition, want to unequivocally say they want to go to war with municipalities, then why don't you just say it? Why don't you just say it, Speaker? On this side of the House, Order. we're going to work with our municipal partners. In fact, our housing uh, prevention program that we just announced provided her city 
with an additional $17 Member for million. Hamilton dollars. West. This Member for Hamilton West and Castor Dundas must come to order. The member for Hamilton Mountain must come to order. Minister, please complete your response. With, uh, with these members in Hamilton as well to create a climate condition yeah. where we can build housing. The fact of the matter is, Speaker, again, not one response. New Democrat has stood up for our call to the federal government for our fair okay. share of $490 million. We've got lots of support, including your mayor supports our call. So why don't you uh, join us? and your mayor in asking the federal government to pay their fair share for homeless prevention. The next question, the member for Ottawa Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Premier. Seeing all the complaints and the distress of so many families, it can't be denied that this government's track record on autism has been abysmal. It has done serious and permanent damage to the lives of children and families with autism. In 2019, this government promised to clear the wait list. Since then, Order. since they made that promise, they destroyed the autism program and claim that they are making progress in building a new one. Nobody is seeing that progress, Mr. Speaker. Over 53,000 children are not seeing that progress, Mr. Speaker. All they see is just another broken promise. Oh, and the $5,000 subsidy that they're going to talk about, that's not proper support, Mr. Speaker, especially when most parents don't have access to that subsidy. The autism program is in shambles because of active choices made by this government. What, the, what will Question. the Premier do to fix the autism mess that they have created from their, for themselves? The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. Thank you, Speaker. Shortly after we formed government in 2018, there were 31,500 people registered for the Ontario Autism Program, of whom only 8,500 were receiving supports. That means that fewer than a third of people enrolled in the program under the previous Liberal government were receiving any support, and that support was limited to behavioural therapy. The other two-thirds, that's 23,000 children, had no prospect of ever receiving support from the old program. Today, roughly 40,000 children and youth with autism are receiving support through multiple streams, like existing behavioural plans, childhood budgets, interim one-time funding. That's five times more children receiving support than at any point before we formed government. And I can list Response. for the member opposite uh, in case they've missed all the, all the uh, facts. We're making continued progress. We are making good progress in providing children with autism and their families with the supports. Stop the clock. Stop the clock. Member for Hamilton Mountain, come to order. Restart the clock. Member for Ottawa Vanier has the floor. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is very unfortunate, and this wouldn't be happening if the government was listening. There wouldn't be parents complaining, being in distress. And I spoke again with those families again this morning. And they shared with me that their children are in crisis. They're not getting the help they need. And they feel abandoned, abandoned by the choices this government made to demolish the Ontario Autism Program, abandoned by the broken promise on doubling the autism budget, but not actually spending the money in that budget, abandoned by breaking their promise to parents in April 2020 that a needs-based program would be coming in 2021, abandoned because it's now 2020 there's no functioning program despite what the minister said the wait list is growing and the government is not actually spending the money family needs and deserve so my question is again when will this government stop breaking their promises question. prioritize children with autism and finally provide access to meaningful autism therapy in ontario reply minister for children community and social services 
Thank you, Speaker. I appreciate the opportunity to give the facts. Our government has doubled the funding for the Ontario Autism Program from $300 million to $600 million. We have almost five times as many children receiving supports right now for 40,000 children. That is, as I've said, five times as many, more, as many children than ever before. The previous government promised results and only delivered... Stop. in our presence. Um, outbursts are inappropriate, unacceptable. We can't uh, fulfill our responsibility as a legislature if there are outbursts from the visitors who are here. I think that was explained to everyone on their way in. And, and if it continues, if anybody else uh, participates in the demonstration, they'll be asked to leave. Start the clock. The Minister of Children, Community and Social Services. The previous government promised results and only delivered support to 25 per cent of eligible children, leaving 23,000 children without support and with little prospect of ever getting it. Almost 34,000 invitations have been sent out to children to come into the program with interim funding. 11,000 invitations have been sent out for childhood benefits. This is a world-leading program that has been developed by the autism community. Opposition for the come to order. Autism community. It involves Response. mental health supports that were never provided before. This is a needs-based program uh, that is making very good progress and will continue that important work. The next question, the member for Don Valley North. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of College and Universities. Speaker, we, are, we all know that COVID-19 pandemic has emphasized how vital healthcare professionals are in this province. And we all know there are many components when it comes to maintaining a strong healthcare system, especially the training, education, support, and the retirement of healthcare workers are all crucial elements to ensuring a strong workforce. Speaker, since day one, this government has put the healthcare needs of Ontarians first, and that includes supporting healthcare students in Ontario's post-secondary institutions. That is why I want to ask the minister on behalf of the constituents of Don Valley North, what is our government doing to continue to support the students looking to soon join a healthcare related field? Thank you. The minister of Colleges and Universities. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the hardworking member from Don Valley North for that question. And it's a very important one because our government understands that a high quality healthcare system starts with a high quality post secondary education system. That is why last week I was very excited to announce our new Learn and Stay program. As a first step, the government is investing $81 million to support the expansion of the Community Commitment Program for Nurses, targeting newly graduated registered nurses, registered practical nurses, and nurse practitioners. Over the next four years, 3,000 nurse graduates can receive financial support to cover the cost of their tuition in exchange for committing to practice for two years in underserved communities. To further support the next generation of healthcare workers, we are proud to invest $41.4 million into the clinical education grant to support the clinical education component Response. of nursing education programs. Together, these initiatives build on the government's commitment to protect Ontario's healthcare system and ensure patients can continue to have access to care when they need it, no matter where they live. And Mr. Don Valley North. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister for informing us of the Learning Plus Stay announcement. Speaker, I know this initiative will help Ontarians get access to the high-quality health care they need and deserve. 
The leadership that the ministry is taking to increase the number of trained healthcare professionals will make the tangible difference for the people in my riding of Don Valley North. Speaker, while this fantastic initiative will support nursing education, I am curious as to what is being done to support the medical education in order to support our future doctors. So through you, Mr. Speaker, what is the minister doing to support the medical student and to ensure a more resilient health care system in Ontario? Thank you. Thank you. Minister of Colleges and Universities. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the member for their interest in the prosperity of health care in this province. Speaker, these past few weeks have been an exciting time for aspiring doctors and both current and future medical school students. Earlier this month, our government announced that we are expanding medical school education as we continue to build a stronger, more resilient health care system, especially in growing and underserved communities. Our government is proud to be adding 160 undergraduate seats and 295 postgraduate positions to six medical schools over the next five years, the largest expansion of undergraduate and postgraduate education in over 10 years. As our government continues to make record investments to build up our health infrastructure, we're ensuring that we have the trained professionals needed to care for a growing Ontario and that we're supporting students along the way. Our government is saying yes to students, yes to health care workers, and yes to supporting a strong health care system that will support Ontario's health care for decades to come. Next question, the member for Spadina, Fort York. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Environment, Conservation and Parks. In 2020, Canadians recycled 4.1 million kilograms of batteries, and these batteries used to go to Ontario's biggest battery recycling plant, the Raw Materials Company. But CBC Marketplace has discovered that batteries are now being recycled in Michigan. So my question to the minister is, what does this government have against Ontario workers and Ontario companies, and why are you allowing recycling jobs to be exported to Michigan? Minister of the Environment, Conservation and Parks. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for that question. It's a good one, Speaker, and we're looking into the contractual issues that have resulted in this, uh, Speaker. But what I will say the government is committed to doing, and we've backed it up with strong legislation and a critical path forward, we understand that Ontarians want to recycle more for decades. I would add to the member opposite, respectfully supported by your party, Ontario was stalled at 30% waste diversion rate. We've said yes to recycling more. We've said yes to working with industry. We're putting a price on that packaging. We're saying that producers need to be responsible for the end use of the products that they put in landfills. And we set among the highest targets in North America to divert waste from landfills. We'll take no lessons on how to recycle from the party opposite. Thank you, Speaker. It would be nice if this government would say yes to Ontario workers and Ontario companies, but instead, in the upcoming election, Ontarians are going to remember that your government closed Ontario small businesses while allowing big box stores to remain open. Right. You let 25,000 Ontario small businesses go under in 2020 before you rolled out the first round of relief grants. And now, Ontarians are going to be thinking that that five cent recycling charge that they pay on every battery is not staying in Ontario. Joanne St. Godard, the head of the Circular Innovation Council, asked, where is the money going and how is it being managed? And I want to echo that question. I want to bring that message to the, to the, the question to the minister. And I want to ask, why aren't these jobs staying in Ontario? Good the Minister of the Environment. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, we'll take no lessons from the member opposite about jobs. Their Green New Deal would crush this province, sending workers fleeing from Ontario. We know that was the reality when they propped up the previous Liberal government with manufacturing jobs fleeing. I'll tell that member opposite what we're doing for workers. We're working with the steel sector, six megatons reduction in GHG. And you know how many jobs have left? None. You know how many are staying? We're growing the amount of jobs in this province. We're actually building transit, creating jobs for folks in the skilled trades. We know that member opposite does not care about workers in the skilled trades. They would have made investments had they cared when they propped up the previous government. We're delivering the lowest carbon major transit initiative in Ontario's history. And we're not stopping there, Speaker. We're building critical minerals, the batteries of tomorrow, supporting Indigenous communities in the north, working with them. We're not going to stop, but we're not 
going to crush workers with a Green New Deal that would crush this province and bring us to our knees. The next question, the member for Durham. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Education. Uh, families and providers in Durham for, uh, for child care are reviewing this $13.2 billion child care deal, which aims to lower fees for families. Uh, one thing stood out to me in the press release, and I'm hoping the minister can expand on it. Uh, it, it says, quote, protection of all for-profit and non-profit child care spaces, helping to support predominantly female entrepreneurs across the province who provide high-quality child care services. As providers review this, Minister, uh, can you uh, uh, tell them what they can expect down the road? Minister of Education. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member from Durham for the question. Uh, Mr. Speaker, if I could invoke uh, the position and the statement of the Association of Daycare Operators of Ontario to answer the member's question. She said, all licensed centres can apply to participate in this $10 a day program, including those run as small businesses. This is really key. Without this provision, a lot of families would have been excluded. And she went on to express gratitude to the Premier and colleagues for, quote, prioritizing flexibility and choice for Ontario families, end quote. Mr. Speaker, we believe, as progressive Conservatives, that parents make the best decisions how to raise their children. We believe that moms and dads will make that decision, and government shouldn't create a barrier or an impediment to the support they deserve. It's precisely why we fought for several months to ensure extension of support for for-profit and non-profit child care centres, which is a fundamental Response. contrast where the members of the Liberal Party would have taken the first deal, excluding roughly 25 per cent of child care operators in the province. We're proud to stand up for choice, for flexibility, for more investment and for affordable child care for Ontario families. Thank you, Speaker. We know that every family writes their story differently, depending on the needs of their particular children, their work schedules, and what family support they may have. Uh, one of the early moves of, of this government was to bring in a child care tax credit program to start to provide more choice for families. And the press release notes, maintain Ontario's child care tax credit program that supports 300,000 families with expenses in licensed and unlicensed child care. Can you please explain how the government will continue to provide support for families who uh, choose unlicensed child care? Minister of Education. Uh, thank you, Speaker. I think it's a really important question because while we, in this child care deal with Canada and mm -hmm. Ontario, have announced a program that will provide significant savings, upwards of $12,000 on average, uh, as we achieve $10 a day by year 2025, you know we're talking about a 50% reduction for by this Christmas of this year for thousands of families in Ontario to finally deliver affordable child care, finally do what no Liberal Premier could do, which is create affordable child care for the families we serve. But, Mr. Speaker to the question for those not using institutional daycare this government is continuing to provide relief to the Ontario child care tax credit providing up to 75 percent of eligible expenses to 300,000 families and this is a measure that recognizes the inherent costs of child care regardless of where and how you choose to raise your child at a YMCA at a Montessori or at the in-laws everyone deserves support and that's why we're continuing to provide relief. Response. It is regrettable that the Liberals have opposed this, fund, this uh, tax measure, but we will continue to provide relief directly to families to deliver the financial savings they deserve. Thank you. Next, we have the member for Niagara West. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. Our government knows that reliable internet is the key to grow in rural Ontario, and I know that in Niagara, families, farmers, and businesses have lacked access in many areas to reliable broadband connectivity for far too long. This government, under the leadership of Premier Ford and the great Minister of Infrastructure, have a plan to achieve nearly 100% connectivity in every corner of Ontario by investing $4 billion, the largest investment by any province. Reliable broadband keeps families and businesses in touch. It opens new doors for businesses and gives farmers access to new tools and technologies. I know that I was proud to announce at the Caster Community Centre our government is supporting another southwestern integrated fibre technology project in Niagara, and I'm wondering if the minister can describe to the House the importance of this project for my residents in Niagara West. Minister of Agriculture, Food and Rural Affairs. 
Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the amazing member from Niagara West. You know, his advocacy for the Niagara region is second to none, and uh, because of that, investments are being made, and investments are being made through the support of our, our Premier as well as the incredible Minister of Infrastructure that he referenced. And it's amazing to see how it's our government that's building connectivity. It's our government that's bringing and getting it done because people deserve opportunity to work from home and to grow their business and to compete at not only a regional, provincial, but national and international basis. And because of that, we invested a million dollars recently in the member of, from Niagara West communities, and that's going to see connectivity in Abington, Allen's Corners, Caisterville, Caister Five. Centre, Fulton, Grasby, Grimsby Centre, and Kimbo. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Speaker. And it was an incredibly important news for the residents in that communities and in those communities. And I heard many of those residents speak about how pleased they were. But I know that there are also other projects, including $17.9 million for a project in the Niagara region that's going to connect over 5,500 rural homes, businesses, and farms to reliable high-speed internet. Now, Niagara West gladly welcomes this investment. And I know that across Niagara, agriculture is responsible for over 20,000 jobs and a billion dollars in GDP to our provincial economy. Truly substantial. With with expanded access to reliable broadband, these farms in the agricultural community will be able to access new markets, increase their competitiveness, and boost their economic output. So through you, Speaker, could the Minister tell us how expanded broadband will benefit our farmers not only in Niagara, but really across the province? Minister of Agriculture. I'd be pleased to, Mr. Speaker, because as the member alluded to, agriculture is a sector that is driving innovation and they're early adopters to leading, at techno leading edge technologies. And it's our government that's building this connectivity with an investment of over $63 million, specifically through SWIFT, to connect over 58,000 households and businesses in southwestern Ontario. Now, specifically with farmers, again, we're leading edge. It's farmers in their fields that are using G GPS that are going to enable them to be pre precision is precision targeted so that we're using the right product at the right time at the right place at the right rate and that is going to enable them to produce better yields and more food for Ontarians and around the world. And furthermore, you know, agriculture is embracing technology in such ways that we can enable better nutrition for Response. our livestock. Premier, the list goes on and on, and this is something we should be all proud of in this House. Thank you very much. Next question, the member for London West. Uh, thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, Best Care is a chronic disease management program created three years ago to support patients in London and across the Southwest who are living with COPD and heart failure. The program has led to a 51% reduction in urgent physician visits, a 60% reduction in hospitalizations, and a 63% reduction in emergency department visits. That's not only better for the 10,000 patients enrolled in the program, program, but it means savings of $1,000 per patient or $10 million that can be reinvested into health care. Speaker, despite extensive evidence proving the success of the program, this government has refused to extend best care funding beyond March 31st, and staff termination notices must go out in just one week. Speaker, will this government commit today to renewing best care funding? The government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate the, the question from the member opposite. Look, obviously, we're looking across, uh, across multiple sectors to ensure that we have enough funding uh, uh, for programs uh, such as this, Mr. Speaker. It is part of our commitment that we have made right from day one to improve health care across the province of Ontario, and it is part of a continuing uh, uh, series of investments. It really started right from the beginning, not only with long-term care, but the transition to Ontario health teams, Mr. Speaker, uh, which is a groundbreaking way of, 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 of providing health care to the people of the province of Ontario. It's a blanket of care, Mr. Speaker. So whether it's the services that the member uh, is talking about, whether it's home care, uh, whether it's access to a doctor, people will have the best quality of care possible to them, and it will be directed, Mr. Speaker. No longer will people have to fight to get within the system. They will have an avenue in, Mr. Speaker. And it is also, of course, part of that uh, enormous investment that we're making, the highest Response. investment in, uh, in health care 
uh, in the history of the province, Mr. Speaker. More, more work is obviously uh, uh, needs to be done, Speaker, but we will continue on that work, not only for the next couple of months, but I'm sure well beyond uh, uh, the next election. Thank you. The supplementary question. I want to direct my supplementary to the Minister of Labour because he is well aware of the success of this program in his riding. Jeanette Mann lives just outside London and is one of the 1.2 million Ontarians living with COPD and heart failure. She has severe asthma and was diagnosed with COPD in 2021. She says, being in the Best Care program has changed my life. Her message to the government is, you have the power to change patients' lives for the better. Please give them the opportunity I got. It's great to be able to breathe. Speaker, the clock is ticking. There is only one week left to save the Best Care program. I ask again, will this government commit today to improving quality of life and health for Jeanette and the thousands of southwestern Ontario patients like her and continue funding the Best Care program? And the government also. Yeah, Mr. Speaker, look, there are so many good programs across the province of Ontario, programs that have been supported by this government, Mr. Speaker, uh, and, uh, and additional programs that we've put in place to ensure that Ontarians have access to the best quality health care system, not only uh, in, uh, in, in Canada, but Mr. Speaker, but North America. It is part of uh, uh, what we started right from the beginning. We knew that when we came to office, there was a lot of things that had to be done, whether it was long-term care, whether it was, uh, whether it was improving health care. That's why we're building more hospitals. That's why Ottawa is getting a brand new hospital. Peel is getting a, a brand new hospital. Brampton is getting a brand new hospital. Three new hospitals uh, in Niagara, Mr. Speaker. That's why we are hiring so many additional health care workers, 27,000 in long-term care alone, new nurses. We've We've added uh, uh, health uh, uh, medical schools in Brampton, Mr. Speaker, uh, in, in Durham, in Scarborough, because we know that we have to do better. We cannot allow the failures Response. of the past 15 years, uh, in the, the 15 years prior to us coming to government, to inform the decisions that we make going forward. So whether it's the services that the member is talking about or other services that are so critical to ensuring that we have the best quality health care, we will always be there for the people of the province of Ontario. A member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Uh, Speaker, when I had the privilege of serving as Premier of Ontario, one of the most important tasks I had was to work with my caucus and my cabinet teams to land on the implementation plan for our platform commitments. After our re-election in 2014, I determined that in order to give the people of Ontario the opportunity to know exactly what we plan to do, our government became the first in Ontario's history to release our minister's mandate letters to the public. In 2015, the federal government followed suit and released their mandate letters. Speaker, to me, open government included accountability for the work to which we had committed. Order. Speaker, it's not that Order. mandate letters are exciting reading, but under our government, they were available. People could track our progress on commitments and our successes and challenges were Order. there for all to see. Speaker, this government is fighting in the courts to avoid releasing ministers' mandate letters. Why is the government reluctant to let the people of Ontario Question. look at the Premier's expectations of his ministers? And, Speaker, is it because those mandate letters include instructions to break the few platform promises they made in 2018? Government House Leader. Mr. Speaker, I recall in 2003 when the member joined uh, the government, I think the, the, the government of the day in 2003 made something like 173 promises, and I, I remember they broke every single one of those promises. And now we have, and now we have the minister, now we have the, minister, the, the former premier getting up and talking about breaking promises. Here's the promise, here's the promise that we made to the people of the, prom, the province of Ontario. Minister of Heritage, Sport, Culture, Tourism, and come to order. Member for Ottawa South, come to order. We start the clock. Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Obviously, we touched a nerve with uh, with uh, two uh, members of the Liberal Party who remain. Uh, Speaker, we made a promise to the people of the province of Ontario to get the province back on track. Why? Because after 15 years of failures by the Liberal Party, jobs fled the province of Ontario. Now they're coming back. That was our mandate. We're getting it done. We had a mandate to build transit and transportation. They didn't do it. That was our mandate. We're getting it done. We had a mandate to make education better for the students of the province of Ontario who were failing, failing under that premier and under that government, we're getting it done. That was our mandate, and we're getting it done. Supplementary question. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So I ask the Premier again, is he reluctant to release the mandate letters because, in fact, while he promised to clear the autism wait list, his instruction to his minister was to do no such thing, and now the situation is much worse than it was in 2018? Was it because, while he said he was going to maintain the status quo on rent control, his instruction to his minister was actually to cancel rent control? While he said he was going to continue the basic income pilot, his instruction to his minister was actually to cancel it as soon as possible. While he said he was going to protect the green belt and fight against cronyism, he had no intention of doing Order. either. Speaker, there really can be only one reason this government continues to fight in the courts to avoid releasing their mandate letters. They do not want the people of Ontario to see Order. what their ministers were told to do before the election in a few weeks. They do not want anyone to know that their actual plan was to make unnecessary cuts to the services the people of Ontario rely Question. on. Why else would they stubbornly refuse to shine a light on their work plan? If that assessment is inaccurate, then as I ask the Premier to release his minister's mandate letters and shine a light on what he did ask them to do. The House Leader respond. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This is coming from a party best known for cash for access, a party best known for, best known for the Orange scandal, a party, best known, a party best known for putting windmills in places where— Stop the clock. Okay. Member for Don Valley West will come to order. Once again, the Minister for Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries will come to order. Member for Hamilton Mountain will come to order. The member for Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke will come to order. Start the clock. Government House Leader. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Look, Mr. Speaker, uh, we are three weeks or so away from an election in the province of Ontario. When people go to the polls, they're going to ask themselves, are they better off today than they were under the previous Liberal administration supported by the NDP? And they will know that on every single thing that matters to them, a progressive Conservative government has delivered. We have delivered subways for the people of Scarborough. We've delivered better health care for the people of Ontario. We have opened up the North in a way so that they Order. can participate in the economic growth and development. We've made life better for people in the trades, Mr. Speaker. We've made life better for people who want to get into the trades, Mr. Speaker. We have made more investments in health. We've reduced costs for the people of the province of Ontario, Speaker. We've made life more affordable. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing is doing more to make more homes, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Agriculture is making our farming sustainable on every measure. It is a strong, stable, progressive, conservative majority that is the next question. The next question. The member for Windsor to come see. Kirin, good morning. My question today is to the Associate Minister of mental health and addictions. Good morning, Minister. Speaker, Internet gaming launched in Ontario today, causing concern for 26,000 people with a known gambling addiction and their families. The government is implementing the Responsible Gaming Gambling Council's RG Check program. However, it's still not specifically clear how this program will help people with an addiction to gambling. Speaker, can the minister tell the House why the RG Check program is the government's only support program being offered? Minister of Mental Health and Addictions. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, thank you for that question. In fact, from the time that the Roadmap to Wellness was first discussed in March of 2020, the work that was done with respect to creating the continuums of care, whether it be for mental health or addiction supports, and in this case, a process addiction or uh, a gaming uh, or gambling addiction, we created the supports and services necessary through an investment each and every year prior to the pandemic, because these were problems that existed prior to the pandemic and will continue and actually were exacerbated during the period of time that, that we've been going through COVID. So we consulted with different organizations and dis different groups. We looked at the lifespan of individuals to ensure that we were providing services that were appropriate for each age group. We consulted with different addictions organizations and did the same thing with that. We looked at the care that was needed Response. in rural, remote areas, and we also looked to ensure that we were delivering services that were culturally appropriate for all the people of the province of Ontario, regardless of where they live. The supplementary question. Speaker, Theo Lagakos has concerns. He's the president of the Public Servants Alliance of Canada, 
representing workers at Woodbine uh, Casino. Diana Gabriel is a certified problem gambling counselor in Windsor. She's convinced online gaming will lead to more gambling addictions. That's because there are no tools built into the system to set limits on the time or money that gamblers invest while gaming from their home computers. Speaker, can the minister tell us the depth of the conversations the government had with mental health and addictions experts while developing Ontario's iGaming model? The Associate Minister. Mr. Speaker, and uh, once again, the consultations that, were, that went into the development of the Roadmap to Wellness were extensive. In fact, um, and perhaps you know this, I was in Windsor to come see on numerous occasions at Hotel Dieu to discuss the very needs that we knew were required within the province even before the online gaming. And we talked and discussed different mechanisms that could be put in place, from virtual supports to actual supports, and how to reinforce the different service providers all over the province to ensure that we have the supports necessary to give people the care they need should they wish to get that. Now, at the end of the day, we hope that people will be responsible with their gambling, but if they need supports, we've developed those supports, and those supports do exist in various organizations around the province. Response. And I have to say, probably the leader in the province of Ontario, perhaps North America, is the hospital, Hotel Dieu in Windsor Tecumseh. They do incredible work, and we're continuing to engage with them to ensure people are looked after in the province. Here, here. The next question, the member for Chatham Kent Leamington. Uh, thank you very much, Speaker. My uh, question is to the Solicitor General. You know, the intent of Bill 100, keeping Ontario open uh, for Business Act, may be narrow and noble to prevent trucks from impeding critical infrastructure and trade routes. Unfortunately, it goes much further. The powers confirmed allow for the seizure of all property, including homes, for far less than another convoy or blockade. Cars and trucks may be seized with no hearing or trial. Same with one's license and plates. No hearing, no trial. No presumption of innocence. One is guilty until proven innocent, and there is no incentive or practicable way for one to be proven innocent. Summary arrests without the warrant are also contained in Section 13. The powers are all non-emergency measures. The Act lasts forever. There is no sunset clause. So whatever happened to innocent until proven question. guilty? So, my, uh, so, Speaker, my question to the Solicitor General is, why is your ministry taking a strong-arm approach with the aim of stopping people from conducting peaceful protests in the name of democracy? Solicitor General. You know, the member opposite, coming from a community that, um, frankly, is very directly impacted when our borders are blocked by illegal bl blockades, I would have thought would have a better appreciation of what that impact has on our economy. You know, the literally millions of dollars of trade were not able to pass through as a result of the blockade at the Ambassador Bridge. Uh, kudos and credit to OPP, RCMP, the Windsor Police, and many other uh, police departments that worked together to ensure that that blockade was dealt with as quickly as possible. But Bill 100 will actually give those uh, police officers the ability to act faster. We cannot afford as a province to have our economy come to a standstill again. And what Bill Response. 100 will do is ensure that that is in place so that we can act quickly and they, they can remove those illegal blockades as quickly as possible. It's really important and frankly I'm a little disappointed that as a member who represents a community that is directly um, Im impacted with the blockades and the borders through our international partners, uh, doesn't see the value and the importance of Bill 100. The supplementary question. Very, thank you very much, uh, Speaker. Uh, no, I do understand uh, that particular aspect, Minister, and uh, I, I also went on record in saying that I didn't agree with full blockade of the Ambassador Bridge. I was also grateful that they allowed traffic to go back and forth because of international trade. But the amendments to the Civil uh, Remedies Act, legislation that has been used to seize houses, is unconscionable and completely unwarranted. Everyone is shocked at the lightning pace that this bill is being uh, rammed through the legislature. Bill 100 authorizes the seizure of property, including one's home. 
Uh, law enforcement is also made immune to civil litigation unless bad faith can be proven. Is any of this right, fair, or just? Bill 100 does not affect a virtually permanent state of emergency. It's business as usual. Tyranny will literally become the new norm with no end in sight. Minister, those charged with an offense are entitled to make full answer in defense, have the right to cross-examination of their accuser or question. accusers, and the right to be convicted beyond a reasonable doubt. So my question to the Solicitor General is, is this what anyone voted for or would ever vote for? Is this where you want to take us as an elected representative and a member of the current majority party in power? Solicitor General. Thank you, Speaker. I'm going to make it real for the member opposite. You know, the Ontario greenhouse growers uh, grow and use approximately 3,000 acres in his community and around the, the area. 70% of that product goes south. When there are blockades, and this was happening, that produce is literally rotting in the, uh, the tractors. So if you do not see the value of what Bill 100 will do to make sure that we can clear these Ill illegal blockades, I can tell you that the Ontario Greenhouse Growers Alliance certainly understands. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our question period for this morning. The member for Kiwetanong has a point of order. Yeah. Miigwech, Speaker. Last week, an, in, an Indigenous delegation travelled to the Vatican to have meetings with Pope Francis. The delegation was made up of Indian residential school survivors, leaders, knowledge keepers, and youth. They met with Pope Francis to seek an acknowledgement of the claim by the Roman Catholic Church related to the right of domination over everyone in all the lands known as the Doctrine of Discovery. The removal of the papal bull was not acknowledged. However, um, they were, but also they were also seeking an apology for the church's role in the spiritual, cultural, emotional, physical, and sex sexual violence done to indigenous children in um, Catholic-run Indian residential schools. We know, Speaker, that the wound of all wounds is a spiritual wound. At a public gathering at the Vatican on Friday, Pope Francis offered an apology to the full delegation and committed to visiting Canada later this year. Mr. Speaker, uh, this statement was met with mixed feelings in our nations. Rage, sadness, hurt, relief, and beginnings of hope. Speaker, uh, we are still united in grief. But an apology is just the first step in the long line of action that must be taken in the path forward. We stand in unity with survivors, their families, and all our nations affected by the intergenerational trauma that was done to us by the Catholic Church and other churches. Going forward, we can do better. We must do better. Miigwech. The Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing has a point of order. Speaker, uh, in response to uh, a question in the House, I referred to the Homelessness Prevention Program and the City of Toronto. I, th I believe I might have used the, the, the figure of $17 million. It's actually $170 million that the City of Toronto receives under the Homelessness Prevention Program. Speaker. Next, we have a deferred vote on a private member's notice of motion, number 36. Call in the members. This is a five-minute bell.